Despite the sunlight streaming in through my windows on this cold January day, I am chilled to the bone, which is why I am snuggled up in my darkly academic boyfriend sweatshirt. That's a mouthful. I feel like I'm just reciting something from the J. Peterman catalog. Not sponsored, by the way. When I feel this, ugh. I just want to do nothing. I just want to lounge in bed, cuddle up in a blanket with a mug of tea and read stacks upon stacks of books. I am a reader. I want to read romances in January. A part of me needs to feel that fizzy fuzzy feeling you get when you read romance novels, the falling in love comfort. But another part of me also wants to read murder thrillers. So in winter, I'm a walking contradiction. I want romance, I want happily ever afters, but I also want to catch a serial killer. So speaking of books, I would be hard pressed as a lifelong reader and rom-com writer to not address this headline that you've probably seen across a multitude of YouTube video essays. Is TikTok turning books into fast fashion? Is social media churning out low quality books? Or, and this is a spicy take, is this just another case of good old fashioned literary snobbery? We're gonna talk about what makes a book good and what makes a book trash. We're gonna talk about Colleen Hoover. We're gonna talk about The Fourth Wing. We're gonna talk about Ice Planet Barbarians. My name is Teresa and this this is the literary merit of book talk books. When you are deeply entrenched into the book corner of the internet, you tend to think that everybody else knows what you're talking about. Everybody I know online are readers. Everybody I know offline in real life, they don't read. Maybe they read one book every five years, and those are usually the popular books. Maybe they don't read books at all. I write romantic comedy novels, not movies, not screenplays, novels. And I am indie published. There was a blip of time when I went the whole traditional publishing route, the query trenches for a year, got an agent at a great agency, mind you, and yada, 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 I decided to go my own way. A lot of people in my real life know that I'm a writer. Most of them have not read my books that I know of. Strangely enough, some people not only don't read my books, they like to make it a point to tell me how they'll never read my books or they're not going to read my books. But I know what they're thinking she's written a book and now she's gonna try to force me to read her book. That is not the case. In fact, I would prefer people in my real life not to read my books. That way I can continue to write my books uninhibited so that I won't ever have to look them in the eye and explain why those characters did did that. So for those people who are not deeply entrenched in the book community, I need to talk to you about book talk. TikTok became a massive juggernaut of promoting viral videos. A niche of TikTok is book talk, book talk in the book community. And book talk is basically a kingmaker for certain books and certain authors. Just like Kate Bush's Running Up the Hill, which came out in the 80s, got a new resurgence because of Stranger Things season four and TikTok. Then We Were Liars by E. Lockhart got a new resurgence. It was published years ago, and then all of a sudden it hit the bestsellers list. And then there are authors like Colleen Hoover, which those of us in the indie publishing world knew about. She was already dominating in that sphere because of word of mouth, because of viral videos and recommendations. She got 10 times the sales, maybe even 100 times the sales. Now she's the reigning queen of contemporary romance and the reigning queen of book talk. Book talk is a massive weapon in a writer's arsenal, whether you be traditionally published with one of the big five publishers or you're indie published, which just goes to show what an incredibly lazy marketer I am. Most of my indie writing friends, they're like, Teresa, you gotta get on Book Talk. You should have gotten on Book Talk in 2020 or 2021. And I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some book talk videos of my books. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And now here we are in 2024, and I haven't made a single book talk video, and I on YouTube. And did I ever pimp my, any of my books to you? No. So I guess I shouldn't have gone my own way after all. I should have just let the publishers do what they want with my book instead of me just 
fortunately, I don't know how this happened, one of my books became more popular than the other books. You know, the 80-20 rule. That book is basically 20% of my list, and that book is pulling 80% of the weight out of all my other books. I don't know how this happens, but it's just dumb luck, I guess, or the covers appealing and everything. But we're not here to talk about me and my lazy business practices. We are here to talk about successful authors, <laughs> whether their viral books are as the article compares them to nothing more than fast fashion comparable to a three dollar top that you buy at Shein and that will end up in the landfill is it fast fashion is it low quality books is it trash or if these books have more merit than we've given them credit for are book talk books trash or are the critics just snobs do I have to put on my fake lawyer public defender hat? Maybe I do. Since I'm ill, we're going to just roll with this and we're going to talk about Rebecca Yaros's Iron Flame, which is the sequel, the sophomore novel to her wildly successful book, Fourth Wing. To be perfectly honest with you guys, I have not read Fourth Wing or Iron Flame. So I kind of feel like I'm giving a book report in front of class, having not read the book, but I'm just gonna have to, to wing it. I do know that this book is so popular on Sarah Michelle Geller's Instagram. She took it with her on vacation and she took a photo of the book next to her foot. It has graced Buffy's foot. So that's how popular this book is. So let's find out together what this book is about. 20-year-old Violet Sorengale was supposed to enter the scribe quadrant, living a quiet life among books and history. Now the commanding general, also known as her toughest Talon's mother, has ordered Violet to join the hundreds of candidates striving to become the elite of Navarre dragon riders. Once you enter, there are only two ways out, graduate or die. Okay, it sounds intriguing. You got some dragons giving me Daenerys Targaryen vibes, a dragon riding college, very difficult to pronounce names. Fantasy names are always really difficult for me. I make no secret that I can't pronounce anything. Zadian Rorans, Rorson? Zadian, Zadian Rorson, the Bays Gath. Rural, rural, rural. I can't even pronounce my own name. The millennial trends of naming their babies with very, very difficult names like Tragedy is lost on me because I can't pronounce anything. But that is one of the major critiques of this author mentioned in the articles when her second book came out and she's doing a book panel. She says, guys, I don't speak Gaelic. I am really sorry, but I did find a tutor. I may butcher these words right now. So please have some grace for me. Next year, I will have some better pronunciations for you. So she got roasted hard for not being able to pronounce some of the words, some of the Gaelic terms that she's used in her own book. Her not being able to pronounce certain Gaelic words, that's understandable because I would assume that she spends most of her time writing and not talking. And a lot of writers can see the same word over and over again, not know how to pronounce it. Talking is not their strong suit. They're introverts by nature. They're not going to talk. Some pronunci- some pronunci- some pronunciations are going to get fumbled. There was also critique about how she didn't use the Gaelic terms correctly, like she didn't split any infinitives or something. So that snowballed into the charge of cultural appropriation. You are not Gaelic. You don't know anything about the culture. You took aspects of that culture and you appropriated it for your fantasy world. So the point this article wants to make is a publisher shouldn't be comfortable with having an author so openly take inspiration from a subject matter they're not intimately familiar with. So this brings us into the choppy waters of cultural appropriation, specifically in fantasy. And that opens up a Pandora's box of hot button topics. If I talked about it in this video, this video will be five hours long. I would like to leave you with a few questions that you can let marinate in your mind. It's a very simple question. Should you stay in your lane, write what you know, or should you write what you're interested in and risk offense because they can and will mess up despite years of research. Something will slip through the cracks and somebody will get offended. And if we're going off what this article is saying, a publisher shouldn't be comfortable with having an author so openly take inspiration from a subject matter they're not intimately familiar with, do we expect them to have somebody in the research department who knows about everything, who's like an encyclopedia? Obviously, at this point, we don't want a repeat of Aladdin. You know, we don't want to take a bunch of 
vaguely Middle Eastern cultures and mash it together with Indian culture and call it Arabia. But in the same sense, if you strictly forbid writers to write what they're interested in and just write what they know, if we were going to take cultural appropriation out of the equation completely, would we have Star Wars? Would we not allow George Lucas to make his homage to Kurosawa and borrow elements from Rashomon, from Seven Samurai. Would Game of Thrones exist if George R.R. R. Martin, writing only what he knew and what he knew was New Mexico, would that series exist if he hadn't paid homage, weaved the history of the War of the Roses, the 13th century English War of the Roses. Would Diana Gabaldon, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing her name right, and I've been a fan of hers for 20 years, read like 90% of all her books, reread some of her books, can't even pronounce her name. For 10 years, I called her Gabaldon. Would she be able to create Outlander if she only wrote what she knew? which is Arizona. She did extensive research on Scottish culture, the Jacobites, 18th century. If she only wrote what she knew, it would just be about a professor in Arizona. And I don't really think that there is a right or wrong answer, to be honest. I like to inhabit that gray area between, what about this? What about this? I'm a Libra, gotta balance out the pros and cons. But let's not diverge from the point of this chaotic video essay. Is social media turning books into fast fashion? What constitutes trashy books versus books of literary merit? Do viral books with mass commercial appeal also deserve literary merit? I promise you it will be uplifting because I'm here as a public defender trying to defend people who are trashed online. So let's talk about the case of book talk queen Colleen Hoover. So one of the critiques I see about viral book talk books, especially the romance variety and especially Colleen Hoover's vast library of books that have blown up is that it's digestible and sensational. Predictable storylines, enemies to lovers, fake dating, spicy material. The critique is that these books are popcorn reads. Easy to read, easy to understand, has no merit. The equivalent of bubblegum pop. If it were a meal, it would be a Big Mac versus a piece of literature is like molecular gastronomy, a Wagyu steak. If we were a car, Colleen Hoover's books, book talk books, are like, like a Prius. It gets you around versus a book of quality literature, maybe the classic, maybe a book that's won the Pulitzer Prize Award, a literary fiction. It's a Ferrari. It's something to covet. If you own it, then people will envy you. If you read it and you make it known that you read these type of books, people will equate you with being an intelligent person, an intelligent reader. That's what we want. So Colleen Hoover is currently the reigning queen of book talk. Her books are wildly successful. She was indie published before, self-published before. And I believe when she blew up on Book Talk, then the traditional publishers swooped in, offered her contracts, offered to republish the books that she had originally published herself. And that's a whole other story here. The critique is that her books have no literary merit, that they are not good for you. They're toxic, romanticized, toxic relationships, fluff. Trash. That is why we get that headline, are books turning into fast fashion? You could read like 50 Colleen Hoover books. She's very prolific, but are they trash? As someone who knows of Colleen Hoover, who's always known of Colleen Hoover, even before she blew up on Book Talk, but does not know Colleen Hoover personally, I've never talked to her before, never, never even commented on any of her social media stuff, has only read samples of her books, but never completely finished her books. In other words, her books are not for me. I mean, I just never feel like reading them, okay? I am Switzerland, I am neutral here. I'm gonna venture to say that her books are not trash. And the reason being is that she has been either lauded, she's been praised, and at the same time, she's been critiqued because her writing is very simple. It's very digestible. The norm core of romances, the norm core of books, the everything bagel. There's something for everybody. If you want a domestic contemporary drama about 
a toxic relationship, you got it. If you want some spicy times, you got it. It's very easy to consume. That's what some critics would say is the weakness of her books. But look at it this way. In a time when you have a multitude of distractions at your fingertips, TikTok sucking away three hours of your life. You have YouTube, you have me distracting you right now. 20 streaming services. You can watch whatever movie you want to watch at any time. All of Spotify at your fingertips. There's a lot of stuff to distract you from reading. We're not living in the 90s anymore. We're not living in the 80s. We're not living in the 1880s. Back then, when you're bored, you don't have a lot of options. In today's day and age, we have so many distractions. And that's not to mention working a 40 hour plus job or several jobs. A variety of different stimuli coming at someone. And then along comes Colleen Hoover and people are actually reading her books. Not just a few people, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people. Her books are touching people to the point that word of mouth is spreading. So think about that. Think about what she's able to achieve. In this world of unlimited distractions, she's able to get hundreds of thousands of people to read. Of all the things that somebody can do with their free time, they've chosen to read her book. She's able to touch people that they read not just one of her books, not just Ugly Love, but they read November 9th. There's probably somebody out there that's read all her books. And I think that's amazing. That's a giant accomplishment. So why are we minimizing that? There's something about her writing that touches people. The fact that her writing is so simple, that her prose is so simple, it's clear rather than poetic. That itself is an art that is very unacknowledged. The simple sentence, a cat in the hat. See Jane run. Somehow in our culture, in school, also in college, if you're an English major, we have been conditioned to think that a book that is difficult to, to read requires a little bit more brain power, it contains long poetic sentences wrapped in metaphor, you know, the literary fiction. We have been conditioned to think that kind of book is a more superior book than a book that is of commercial appeal. Romance novels, the old romance novels with Fabio on the cover, the James Patterson's, even Stephen King's. Basically the books that you see at the grocery store checkout line, the books that you see at airports, the books that are supposed to just help you while away your time while on an airplane, on the subway, etc. So we have been conditioned to believe a book that is more difficult to read, that you have to comprehend it a little bit more, that you have to close read it, is a more superior book, has literary merit. We propped it up on this pedestal versus a book that is easy to understand. Goosebumps, young adult, why? books like like Twilight. Twilight notoriously pans by one and all is a trashy book, a bad book. But I am of the opinion that there are no bad books. There's just the wrong book for the wrong reader. And then in the same vein, there's the right book for the right reader. For instance, several years ago, I got a Kindle book. It's a uh, it's a spicy Kindle book about a maid who, um, who does her chores and does other things with the masters and mistresses of the house. Sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes um, as a team. This book is riddled with typos to the point where at the end of the book, the maid's name is Leah, L-I-A. The author, I don't know if she forgot to find or replace the name, but at the end of the book, her name changes to Rhea. And I'm like, who's Rhea? And I would rate this book as a three and a half. Despite all the typos, despite the author messing up the find and replace of the character's name, I'm, despite all that, I still enjoy the book. I'm gonna give it a thumbs up. It was an enjoyable read. I mean, it's not the best book I've ever read. I would like the main character's name to stay consistent. At the same time, I enjoy Crime and Punishment. I, I read Anna Karenia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right either. And I rank that as the three and a half or something. The same ranking as a book that messes up the main character's name and is riddled with typos. This classic piece of literature I put on par with this self-published spicy, spicy book about a maid who does her chores and other things and other people. Does the spicy maid book have literary merit? Did it do its job of entertaining and distracting and giving the reader a few laughs? maybe unintentional laughs. Is it a good, bad movie? The main thing that I need to get out of reading is that I need to be entertained. Life is a grind. Life sometimes wears on you and that's why you read so you could escape and you be entertained. Does the book entertain me despite all the mistakes, despite the glaring typos, despite the main character not having
having the same name at the end. Does it entertain me? Yes, it does. So I put it on the same ranking level as Crime and Punishment, which entertained me for other reasons. I want to escape. I want to feel happily ever after, but sometimes I don't want to feel happily ever after. I want to feel suspense. I want to catch that serial killer. Sometimes I want to read a book that really wows me with the craft, with the poetic language. Sometimes I'm all into that. Everybody has their different intrinsic rating system, but to call a book like Colleen Hoover's trash, not acknowledging the amazing accomplishment that she has done is to get people to read at a time when they can do anything else but read. Isn't there some literary merit to simple prose? Let me tell you a secret, guys. It is difficult to write something simple. It is difficult to be clear and not clever. When you are first starting out writing, you are going to imitate your favorite writers. You like Stephen King, you're gonna try to imitate how Stephen King writes. You like Ray Bradbury, everything you write will be tinted with nostalgia. You like Jane Austen, everything's gonna be very formal but with a dry, brittle humor. You like Cormac McCarthy, everything you write, you're not gonna punctuate anything. There is going to be no dialogue tags. You're gonna imitate your favorite writers. And another thing is that you're going to write overly purple prose. You're gonna think this is good writing, long poetic sentences extended metaphors. I shudder to think of the stuff I wrote in high school. I would write these AP essays. They would sound what I thought was intelligent, but if I were to read it now, it's like, come on, like you're writing a 20 word sentence here. You're using all the SAT words that you've ever learned. It's horrible. And he epoxied, like what is epoxied? That is the amateur level of writing because you take in all the books that you've read. I need it to sound poetic. I need it to sound intelligent. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Ignorance is bliss. You think you sound very intelligent. It's hard to read. You're going for clever over clear. The frills, it's the trills. It's like when a singer goes, ah! Did you need that? You're not Whitney. You just sing the note. As you go on in your journey through practice, through having other people read your work and rip it to shreds, you're gonna realize that good writing is simple writing. Less is more. Good writing is actually invisible writing. If a reader reads your book and they notice your writing, like it's glaringly noticeable to them and they can't focus on the story, is that good writing? Isn't your point to transport the character into the story so so that they forget that they're actually reading a book. They're in the story. And that's what Colleen Hoover has done for a lot of people. That's what I hope that I have done for some people. A lot of people would say, my books are easy to read. I make it a point never to read any of my reviews, but sometimes people tag me on Instagram and I am forced to read the reviews. I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna see it. This is easy to read. I had fun with the characters. It's silly, it's lighthearted. Three stars. It sounds like a backhanded compliment, but it's a compliment. Trust me, I work hard on being easy to read. Your whole goal, at least as a like a more commercialized writer, writer of romance, is to transport the reader into the story to the point that they don't notice your writing. They don't even know who you are. Like you are non-existent. Your writing is invisible. Your writing is a Prius. You're here to take the character on a road trip without breaking down. You're here to be reliable. You're not here to be flashy. You're not a Lamborghini. You're not a Ferrari where people notice like every single detail about you. You're here to just get them through this road trip without breaking down. Of course, if you're the type of writer that wants people to notice your writing, and I would say that's more of a literary writer, you want to be that Ferrari. You want people to notice the paint job. You want people to notice the quirks and features. You want people to hear the engine. But as a romance writer who is aiming for more mass appeal, commercial stuff, maybe even bubblegum pop stuff, you want to be that Prius. You're invisible. And that is what Colleen Hoover has successfully done. So my point is that the simple sentence, the simple prose, it takes skill and nobody will ever acknowledge that skill. So Colleen Hoover, I don't know you, but I get you. There are readers that love her books despite the toxic, problematic relationships. I would venture to say a lot of people in real life have probably more toxic relationships than they have healthy relationships and her books speak to them. Maybe they see something in her book that they can relate to. If they go through a bunch of books with people with healthy relationships, 
relationships? What if you have a toxic relationship in your life and you just want to connect here? If people didn't have toxic relationships in their lives, why is there so many podcasts about narcissism, about cutting out the toxic people in your life? Why is there so much self-help advice out there if that wasn't a legitimate problem? And a lot of times with character growth and character journey, a lot of characters have to start out flawed, have to start out, dare we call, problematic or toxic. And then they learn throughout the story and then they become healthier versions of themselves. If you were to start off a story with a character who is completely likable and likable subjective, depending on who you're talking to. A lot of people watching this right now may think I'm very unlikable. These hand gestures, so unlikable. This face, so unlikable. But at the same time, some of you may 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 like me. If you start off the story with healthy, well-adjusted characters, how boring would that story be? They're never going to go through any kind of hero's journey, never going to learn anything. Your characters need flaws, and flaws are sometimes toxic. Flaws are sometimes very problematic. In real life, who makes the news? What kind of stories are we drawn to? It's problematic people. Do you click on video essays about perfect people. People don't talk about perfect people. Those people are under the radar. And I don't really think anybody's really that healthy or well-adjusted, to be honest. That's why if there's self-help books out there, there's people in need of change. Toxic people make good stories. A lot of people don't like people with flaws, with glaring flaws, but they want to read about them. So in the world of Colleen Hoover, she writes about flawed characters, very flawed characters, and it resonates with a lot of readers who maybe see some aspect of those flawed characters in their partners, somebody they dated, in their family, and their friends. There's a lot more toxic people out there than you can think. Twilight has gotten a lot of heat because once again, it's wildly popular. It's big game for those that want to bring it down. It's been panned by, I don't know, literary critics, people online. I was not heavy into Twilight, but I read the books when I was in my early 20s. I liked it. I liked it at the time. I recommended it to a friend and she was not a reader. She hated reading books. When she read Twilight, it was like a door opened up. She devoured Twilight, read all the books in the Twilight series, and it launched her off into reading The Hunger Games, into more advanced literature and now she's a lifelong reader because of Twilight. Is Twilight trash if it's a vehicle that can propel somebody into liking other books that are not considered trash? Are viral book talk books, books made for mass consumption, are they trash? Are they are they fast fashion? I would say no they're not. If they touch a reader, if they make a reader happy, if they entertain a reader, if a reader is sitting in a hospital room waiting for like a cancer diagnosis, if it distracts you from whatever is going on in your life, or if it brings you a few hours of escape, if it gives you that giddy feeling, that butterfly feeling you get when you read a uh, well-deserved happily ever after, then I don't think it's trash. Happiness, the feelings that it brings to you, happiness is not trash. These books of mass commercial appeal, romance novels, sci-fi fantasy, or I equate them to a blue collared parent. They nurture you, they provide for you, they lift you up when you are down. They provide endless hours of entertainment. When you are bone tired and weary coming home on the subway to your lonely apartment, they provide you company, they provide you laughs. They give you a window and insight into another world. At the end of the day, online, you trash talk them, you look down upon them. They're passed up for better things, for finer things, for things of literary merit that at the end of the day, doesn't give a crap about you. And on that terrible disappointment, it is now time for me to go. I could literally talk about this for five hours. I've only polished one prism of the diamond and there are many different prisms of the diamond we can cover. We could talk about Ice Planet Barbarian. I really enjoyed Ice Planet Barbarian before it became popular on Book Talk. I'm all about that spur. Believe me, I could talk about that for an extra eight hours, which is very surprising as in, in my real life, I don't like to talk. In real life, I don't speak at all. I just live my life in silence. I mime things. So that's why I started a YouTube channel in order to improve my speaking. And now all I do is talk. Isn't that funny? And we could also talk about the irony that as a writer, I have never written a single script for any of my YouTube videos. So they're all just improv and I just edit out my mistakes and awkward pauses. Believe me, there's a lot of awkward pauses and a lot of mispronounced words and a lot of cussing and some singing. Sometimes to get myself ready, I just start singing.